Lauren Laverne is turning out to be something of a polymath, from indie pop starlet to radio and TV presenter, and now a novelist. She's got her own daily show on Six Music and a column in Grazia magazine. She used to present The Culture Show, and earlier this year she arrived on Channel 4's 10 o'clock live. She's also synonymous with the BBC's coverage of Glastonbury. Back in the 1990s, she got three A-levels at grade A before ditching university for a record deal with her band Knicky. And she's now doing the supposedly impossible, combining roles as a wife, mum, presenter, DJ, author and columnist. It's not the easiest trick to pull off. She herself has talked about the sexism of television and how radio is a bit of a boys club. But the sexism and ageism TV row has been brewing for years. Is it still the case that the British media is too harsh on women? Do you think women on telly are perhaps, it's expected of them that they must pay a level of attention to their appearance, which men don't have to? Well, I think the men are presentable too. They seem to make the most of themselves. I mean, they're always, they, you know, it's not like they turn up in a tracksuit, is it, really? You know, or... Well, it's encouraging, like, gender binaries, which aren't, which are completely, well, are pretty much socially constructed. But that women have to be like this and men have to be like yeah. that, in other words. When did you last see Heat magazine with... Adrian Childs and lots of different other male presenters in their trunks talking about how fat they are or thin they are. I would prefer to see a pretty girl on TV than, than, a, than an ugly girl, but then it would be the same with boys. I prefer to see a, a good looking guy on TV than an ugly person. Wow, yeah, you were about to climb down a very sexist hole there for a minute. Yeah, that's you've a just risk I'll take. From. The reason we're asking yeah. these questions is because <laughs> they are getting slotted into an interview with Lauren Laverne. Oh. Laura Laverne, you've said this yourself. Life is unfair, telly is unfair, and women do have a harder time. What is the problem? I don't know what the problem is. But as I said, life's unfair, telly's unfair. Um, Why do women have a harder time? And that there is a greater emphasis on appearance and age? I think uh, generally in the world, women have a harder time. And that's what I mean. And I kind of think TV's a small, it's a kind of obviously a microcosm of of a broader situation, isn't it? So, Do you feel under pressure about your appearance to any extent? No, not really. Really? Not really, no. I think um, in some ways it's quite, it is unfair, but I think there are ways that you can use those unfairnesses to your advantage if you can work out how to. Do you know what I mean? It's, for example, you know, it is unfair maybe because people will have expectations of your appearance that they wouldn't have of uh, a peer of yours who was a man. But equally, maybe it's easier uh, because you're there's less women doing the job or less women, in, certainly in the kind of world that I operate in, you know, Six Music, there's not as many female DJs for sure as there are male DJs. So maybe you stand out a bit more. Male TV presenters do get away occasionally with appearing on TV looking quite dishevelled with their shirt hanging out. And you usually, I'm not trying to echo some being sexist here, but, you know, you usually are very, very well turned out. That seems to be part of your job description. Well, it's also part of my identity, I think. I like dressing up. I've always liked dressing up and, and you know, in my, with my background, that is what you do in the North East. You kind of put your best face forward and it's I'm from that kind of culture. So I've never really thought, I've never thought of that as a kind of onerous thing. It's always something that makes me feel better and hopefully makes me able to kind of just forget about stuff and do a better job. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of, I think you can... You can enjoy getting dressed up and looking nice. And if you do, then, you know, and I do, then maybe maybe I'm lucky. <laughs> it's a more innocent explanation than satisfying the demands of a patriarchal culture. You did at least toy with the idea and sort of slightly pursue having a solo career as a musician and I singer, I did a couple right? of things, yeah. I did sort of an EP and I did a couple of guest vocals on, uh, like, Mint Royale track. And weirdly, that was, like... Your biggest bigger hit. hit, yeah. So that was kind of... That was really good fun and I kind of I co-wrote that song. So that was, that was lovely to write the words and... You know, like um, they sort of built a track, and then I sang and a melody. And well, again, was there any element of angst or uh, sadness about the fact that that didn't result in you putting out albums or doing it full time? Not really. I'd started doing TV already at that point. Um, in when the band was right at the end of the band, I uh, was doing both in parallel. I think like a couple of bits, and I really enjoyed that. Um, and. Uh, and then I, I was going out with a guy who didn't think that was very cool. And then we broke up and I just thought, well, actually, 
now I don't really have anyone who disapproves he didn't of. Think being on TV was very. He cool. didn't think the TV presenter was was not very cool. Well, you know, and I can and it wasn't at the time. I mean, you know, when I was twenty three, there was not a vacancy for a kind of slightly geeky, thoughtful kind of you know blonde girl who likes dressing up and wearing stupid clothes and also listens to can you know that did not exist nobody was nobody was after that you know what I mean so I can see why he thought it wasn't it wasn't cool because it wasn't but I really enjoyed it so um so I just thought oh, I'll, I'll give this a try and just see what happens and so I moved back to London because I'd moved home in, in the interim and uh it just kind of worked out in your uh progress in tv You've seen sort of both sides of it in the sense that you've done pretty mainstream, you know, pop TV CD type UK. thing. See the UK and all Survivor. that. Survivor. And you uh, presented the Culture Show. Yep. Which is obviously on the more sort of chin-stroking intellectual side of things. Quiff stroking in the case of... Yeah, and of, you've uh, talked about crowd rock Mark music Kermit. and that aspect of Six Music, which similarly is not for people who necessarily go out and buy Take That Records. It's a bit more high-end. Mm -hmm. And yet you also have a column in Grazia magazine. I mean, you have got those two sort of aspects of... The worlds you seem to I'm inhabit. I'm the shaded area in the Venn diagram, John. What's it like in the Venn diagram, in the middle of the shaded area? Of the it's Venn quite nice. <laughs> I mean, I've got a no-brow approach to... What did you say? No-brow? No-brow approach to kind of culture and music. And uh, uh, and maybe that's, you know, because I, I never went to university and kind of learned to be a snob or, or anything like that. And maybe it's also, I think it's probably to do with my background more than anything. Um, Explain what you mean. Well, my dad is an academic, right? So he writes books and kind of writes, can do... What's his specialism? He's a sociologist, um, but he can kind of, you know, do some pretty chunky kind of reviews for the uh, Times Higher or whatever about, about whatever academic books just come out. You know, he's kind of like a clever guy, but he's from a council estate. So I think maybe I just always feel like those things books and culture and art and should be accessible to everyone and if they're not and if people are being snobby and exclusive then actually they're probably dicks aren't they but on the reverse side of it when you write your grazia column or do something which is a little bit more low brow is there sort of an ironic aspect are you doing a slight art style nothing brow? low brow about my my grazia column harris i will have you retract that i've only statement skim read your grazia well, column I'm exactly afraid. do your research man um, you're quoting nietzsche every week that's the truth isn't it well you know i mean i certainly don't dumb down my music selections for grazia and i don't think i have to i mean you know i think that's also an assumption that kind of comes out of a, a, a belief that you couldn't really be interested in fashion and the and kind of celebrity stories and some of the more frivolous aspects of Grazia and also have an interest that extends beyond that. Of course, people do. People are people are interesting and complicated and and actually it's fine to enjoy those things. And you might also want to go and listen to a. I don't know, a weird record or or read a slightly media book and. And for me as well, the music side of it, it's all just pop music. Do you know what I mean? It's not like when I play a can record, I think I'm like empirically a better person, or okay? <laughs> like <laughs> than when I but play. People it, do. Than when I, people well, do. People do, but they? they're wrong. You know, they are. They are absolutely wrong because that's that's not that's not what it should be about. You famously called the Spice Girls Tory scum. <laughs> I know. I feel a bit bad about that. They're quite nice, really. <laughs> but well, only some of them were Tory scum. What in upset me about that was um, in response to uh, Jerry Halliwell's comment that Mrs. Thatcher was the first Spice Girl, which I found depressing and you know upsetting and made me really angry at the time. I mean, I was eighteen when I said that. I wouldn't say that now because not everybody who's a Tory is scum and. Uh, <laughs> They seem all right. I met them. They were quite nice. Um, but uh, but certainly I would not say that um, Mrs. Thatcher is anyone I would ever want to uh, kind of mythologise or say did anything other for women than mostly bad stuff. Because <laughs> I think while it was great to have a female prime minister, wow, it would have been good if it wasn't her, wouldn't it? You have said that music is partisan. It's a sort of partisan business. It's about who's your favourite. Yes. Right now, who's yours? Oh, right now. Well, it changes every day. I'm really into, I haven't said I'm not a nostalgic person, really into a band called the Bandana Splits from Brooklyn who are uh, fronted by the singer-songwriter called Dawn Landis who's done some very kind of country stuff. And they're like a, 
a three piece vocal girl group who are um, kind of a redux of like uh, the Phil Spector kind of wall of sound girl groups, but also like a little bit of Andrew's sisters in there. And they're, they're very cool. I really like them. So I will go away and listen to the bandana splits. I'm not sure you like them, but I like them. We'll give it a go. <laughs> they're my favourite. <laughs> I don't think they're yours. Lauren Laverne, thank you very much. Thank you.